Hey, you guys, welcome back to another episode of Decoding Athlete. This one is uh, one of the most special episodes for me because uh, I'm interviewing one of my best friends today. Terry Adams, one of the most influential BMX flat rider uh, you can ever think of. He has two Nora Cups. He's uh, won the biggest contest you can ever think of. He's been on Glee and uh, he's been on the Ellen DeGeneres show. I mean, like, it doesn't really get any better than that. So with no further ado, Terry Adams, baby. Hi. What's up, bro? <laughs> 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 so excited so he's so excited dude what time is it in new orleans right now it's uh 5 30 a.m <laughs> why did you wake up so so i was like trying to organize this podcast and terry was like yeah i'm just gonna do it at 5 30 in the morning why is that yeah i've been waking up at like 4 4 50 or so just to just I'm, i'm getting going early man i got a lot of stuff to do during the day so that's insane you also just got a kid a few years ago so that changed some things for you yeah it changed a lot man actually uh he was he was born as you know in like the end of 2018 and uh man as soon as as soon as that guy came out uh everything kind of changed for me i was like almost like my journey was like ready to start over again or something so i got i got re-motivated let me let me hear more about that because For a lot of people, when they have a professional career and then they have a kid, people think, oh, this guy's kind of gonna, gonna get lazy, you know, taking care of his kids. But I feel like for you, it's been the total opposite. So what has been motivating you to write even harder having a kid? I guess, uh, to be exact, because I know exactly what happened in my head was uh as soon as he came out and i was like looking at him you know like i was holding him in my hands i'm like man like it would be really easy for me to bring him over and show him the nor cups and show him the x games medal and you know show him the 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 kog trophies and and show this guy like when he's old enough to understand like that i used to that I used to be really good on the bike and I used to compete at a high level, but that's really the, the, not only the easy way out, but I felt like he wasn't going to get as much out of that from actually seeing me on the bike, seeing me lose, seeing me win. And then more importantly, uh, seeing me put in the hard work and then watching it pay off. So that was a, a huge motivating factor for me to, to see that, to, to know that, that was going to do a lot for him to like kind of watch that in person. So, so you want him to see you win kind of dude, I want him to see me win. I want him to see me lose and I want him to see me like really work for it. So, so like kind of be an inspiration for him through BMX. Exactly. Exactly. Just because I've always felt that, you know, you know how small BMX is and even more so, how small flatland is around the world. I've always felt that if I made this happen and built this life with flatland with as small as is that anything is really possible for any kid to do if they set their mind to it. So, uh, I wanted him to not only like see, see the fruits of everything that I've built, but I wanted him to actually, uh, be a part of it. So. That way he knows that he can do, do anything that he wants to do. I mean, if, if he wants to grow up and be a, a scooter guy or a yo-yo guy, or if he wants to blow bubbles for a living, it's possible. You know, you can figure it out. Because I think, and to me, you are one of the biggest inspiration when it comes to achieving stuff. When you have an idea in your head, you're not going to let it go. And I think a great example of that is when you wanted to go on the Ellen DeGeneres show. And you've told me that story numerous times, and uh, it's one of my favorite stories ever. So Terry has been on the... For those who don't know who Ellen DeGeneres is, it's, it's one of the biggest talk show, maybe the biggest talk show in the United States. It's viewed by millions of Americans. And so Terry did it. He made it. But the way... He did it. It's so inspiring. And 
I, I'll let you tell the story. It's so fucking incredible. What happened? How did you get on the Ellen show? Well, first, the, the reason I even had the idea to start uh, writing letters and picking up the phone and calling was because up until that point, and even today, that's like exactly how I built my entire career. Getting on the, the magazine covers, getting mentioned in the news. I was always just like picking up the phone and calling and calling and calling. So uh, I was sitting there watching the Ellen show because I love Ellen. Uh, so I was watching it and there was a flat space uh, right in the front when she walks out. And I, I looked at Vanessa and I said, man, I got a ride on that floor. And she said, you should, you should uh, do what you normally do. You should, uh, you should, you should aggravate them. You should, you should start calling. You should start writing letters. And uh, that's what I did. I, the, the first thing I did was send a VHS tape. Uh, of me talking and I was, I was holding up the covers that I had just gotten. I think I had gotten the BMX plus cover and before that the ride cover. So I'm basically holding up the covers like Ellen. Uh, I just made these covers. I'm a small town, Louisiana guy. Uh, I would love to be on the show and, and talk about how I'm blowing up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, n I never got a call back. So I said, man, maybe I should send another another one with me riding. So I, I sent a couple videos uh, every couple months with me riding, never got a call back. And then finally, uh, I got a call from one of their producers and they said, man, we, uh, we, we got your video. We got your magazine covers. We got your signatures. We got your letters. And uh, we wanna see if you're, if you're available on Saturday. And I'm like, I'm available any day you want. And uh, they said, okay, we'll call you right back. So I'm screaming through the house, like, I'm like, I'm in this. Well, they, they never called back. What? And they, they never called back, but they left their, their number on my, on my caller ID. So then I had their number. So I'm like, <laughs> That's a mistake because that's what I do best. I call, I call, and I call. So I probably called that number for, man, at least two years, leaving messages. I never, no one would ever pick up, but I, but I would get a voicemail and I would always say, hey, it's Terry again. Like uh, you guys called me two years ago. You guys told me I was going to be on the show or if I was available and uh, no one ever called me back. I'm still interested in being in the show. So finally they called and said, man, you are so determined. We get all your voicemails. We're going to go ahead and send you up here uh, on next week on Saturday. So that, that's essentially how it happened. You know, just me not giving up on, on the dream of, of wanting to go and, and ride on that stage. So basically they had you on the show, of course, because you are great BMX rider, but they had you on the show because you were so like consistent or like, so I don't know, like you really wanted to, to do that. And I think they really appreciated that. And that's why you were on the show. Yeah. I mean, I think they knew I, I wasn't going to give up, so, <laughs> man. It, and the crazy thing is I know for sure if, if I, they wouldn't have called and I would still have that number. I would still be calling, dude, like 10 years today, later. You, you, you st you'd still be calling today? <laughs> but like, how, how many days a week you would be calling them? Or like, how many days a month? At least, at least two or three times a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you made it in there. It's crazy. You are the only BMX athlete that made it to the Ellen Show. It's crazy because uh, I, I listened to your podcast with Danny and he had the opposite of he's like, nah, they called me. They really wanted me on the show. I was like, nah, that's uh, it didn't really fit, you know, my, my sport. I wanted to represent it in a good way. And I'm like, man, that would have been much easier. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And that's that's what I absolutely love about yourself is like. 
in in the best possible way you have no shame when it comes to to you you know like when it comes to self promoting when it comes to uh doing the things you love when it comes to doing your own thing you don't ask yourself question and yeah. i think for the for the kids who are listening and who want to make it as a professional athlete because that's what this podcast is all about is to give advice to the younger generation always believe in yourself and don't do stuff you don't want to do because the guy next to you is doing them and i think terry is the is a great representation of that is that as long as you stick to who you are you're going to make it am i right yeah i mean i think what i'm going to be most proud of when i look back at my career i'm i'm going to be most proud of taking the unconventional route you know i'm not i'm not going to be it's not that i'm going to be really proud that i made it on the ellen show or that i got on the covers it's going to be the story of how i got on the ellen show is what was i was proud of and the story of how i got on the covers is what i'm most proud of i i essentially asked for for everything that i wanted and if people told me no I just kept asking. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like it's called grinding. And uh, I think one of your yep. sponsors is called Grind Legacy. And I think it it's a great fit for you. It's like yep. dude, keep on keep on grinding. Like if it doesn't happen, just keep on keep on doing it and it will happen. And you are a great example of that. Another great Terry Adams life story is how he got one of his Nora cups. And I I and I you, you don't have any problem talking about that, so I'm going to bring that up. But I think so. You won Nora Cup in uh, 2005 and 2008. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. One of the Nora Cup you won it like the convention conventional way. The other yeah. one, a little less conventional. So basically, for those who don't know, Nora Cup is uh, the number one rider award organized by uh, Ride BMX now uh, our BMX, and it's basically in each. BMX categories, it rewards the rider of the year. So it's a bunch of pros and people from the industry that vote online. And then basically whoever gets the most vote uh, gets the award. And it's one of the biggest accomplishment a BMX rider could ever got. And uh, one of the Nora Cup you won it in a less conventional way. Can you tell us a little bit more about this one? <laughs> Yeah, you know, actually, the the reason I went for that Nor Cup in 2008 the way I did was because in 2005, when I won, uh, I got the phone call from Ride to say, hey, you're in the top five. But we, you know, and I said, well, did I win? And of course, you know, they can never tell you. So uh, in my mind, in 2005, man, I'm like, I could never win this, I was thinking. So I I had a, a choice to either be in Vegas in 2005 to maybe accept the Nora Cup, or I had a show that was uh, for Jennifer Lopez riding on the riding on a stage, uh, like with Jennifer Lopez in the front. So I'm like, I'm gonna do the Jennifer Lopez thing. Uh, and I, I think I maybe told them that of like, yeah, I'm probably not gonna make it. and they were pushing me to go, but again, I still didn't think that, that I won. But as you know, 2005, I won, but I wasn't there to accept the award. And I was bummed, man. I was, they called me, someone was trying to put the cell phone to the microphone on stage to get me to talk. And the crowd can't, you know that crowd, they're drunk, you know? <laughs> so 2008, uh, I I had a pretty good year, you know, maybe not a year to where it was going to be a landslide to where I'm definitely going to win, but you, you had, a, you had a decent year in 2008. Yeah, I had a decent year, but it wasn't like Terry's definitely winning. You know, I think it was a perfect year because there was no like super standout. So in my mind, I'm like, I, I'm going to devise a plan, you know, and always what I, what I do even today is if I want a goal, I write down the goal and then underneath the goal, I write an action plan. And I remember my goal was 
I want to win the Norco. And that's a weird goal to have because it's other people voting for you. So it's not, it's not nothing that you can just manifest by doing well. You just have to kind of hope for it. But my action plan below it was just ask people to vote for me. <laughs> so, man, I went through the list of people that I knew that were going to get uh, a chance to vote. And, and then I went through the list of people that I thought would be okay with me asking. You, you know what I mean? Like, I know that some people might say, man, that is whack. So I X those people out and I just went to the people that I'm like, I think they're going to be okay with me asking. So each email was sent separately and it was more of a personal message. So like, for instance, I, I emailed Mike S and I'm like, Hey man, uh, I know you can vote for anyone you want this year, but I just want to remind you that I had a really great year and, uh, I would appreciate your vote. And if you don't want to vote for me, that's fine. But, uh, it would be great, uh, to have your vote because, uh, I feel like I killed it, you know? And, uh, eventually a lot of the writers that I sent the emails Eventually, they were emailing back like, sure, sure, yes, yes, I'm, I'm going to vote for you. So I started going through the names and like putting a check by everyone that I knew that I was going to get the vote from. So, uh, yeah, man, that, that's how it happened. I mean, in a nutshell, I, I kind of walked in there maybe knowing that, that I won. Like, I knew it. I knew it because I, I had the, I had the, the checks. You know, I mean, you never know, like some people can just bullshit, you, you know, like reply to your email saying that they're going to vote for you. But in the end, they, they, they I didn't. Felt so you never I... really know. But what, what, what happened in your head when they called your name? You're like, what happened? I don't know what was going on in my head. But when I was walking off the stage, it was really a moment in my life where I did realize that I can make anything happen if I write it down. If I write it down and it's a goal, like I, I'm going to figure it out, you know? So, man, I was, I was proud that I did something the unconventional way. Like, like you said, I'm, I'm actually proud to tell this story because it's a part of my career that I'll never forget. It's, it's like I said, I'm proud to have the Nor Cup sitting there that says 2008, but I'm more proud of the way I went about getting it. And, uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked about it, man. We can see it behind you, actually, the Nora Cup. Can you? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, the couple. There's a couple. Your buddy was blocking one of them. Couple Nora Cup. One was yes. uh, won by a writer. The other was won by a politician. <laughs> yeah. And, dude, and the day, at, the day after or the week after I won it, my, I, I remember I got a phone call from Alex. And I think Jimmy? he was like, Yeah, and he was partying. Okay. Alex Jumelin. Alex Jumelin is a uh, is another BMX flatland professional rider from uh, from France, and he's a great friend of Terry and I. So sorry, uh, go ahead. So he called, and I I could tell he was partying, maybe with you or with Raphael, someone he was partying with. And I pick up, and he goes, "I hear the the music in the background." He's like, "I have one question for you." I was like, "What? What?" And he's like, "Did you ask?" everyone to vote for you for that cup. And I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> And he goes, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what I love about you is like fucking shameless. And, and you, make, you make stuff happen. And this is, this is a great inspiration for everyone out there because you come from nothing, a small town in Louisiana, and like you made it up there. And I'm, I'm so proud of you and the way, the way you do it. And, uh, I want to, I want to come back to one of the things you said that you write stuff down. And I think that's one of the greatest advice you can give to someone. If you need, if you need to get stuff down, write them down. And I've, I started to, to do that a year ago because I was keep on forgetting to reply to some emails. I was forgetting to, uh, some tricks, ideas, some, some stuff like that. And now it's right there. I got, I bought, I bought like a, 
this this stuff and I'm making to-do lists. And whenever I have an idea or like I need to do something, I write them down. And I feel like we're the same way. I, I once I picked up your phone and there were like five millions uh, written on it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, I was like, oh, and I was like, what, what is that? What is the five millions? I was like, dude, I'm going to make five millions in my lifetime. And I, when whenever you have a goal, write it down, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. It, you know, at first it started like a to-do list when I was younger. And then I realized that writing down the to-do list, I'm always going to be able to mark it out. So probably 2002, 2003, I started writing down goals. And each year I started to make those goals more crazy and more outlandish. And the more I realized the crazier stuff I wrote down, even if I accomplished 70% of those things on that list, uh, those things wouldn't have been even went for if I wouldn't have wrote them down. So today, each year, I'm writing even crazier stuff down. And I'm doing like a vision board where I'm putting actual photos of stuff that I want. And I see that board every day. And I change the board every year. And uh, man, it, it's crazy to go back some years and look at all these crazy pictures that I put on the board. And just from looking at them and keeping them fresh in my mind, that stuff is, is coming true like pretty much every year that I put on the board. I, I have one right here. Show us. That's, that board oh, wow. has a bunch... It has a bunch of pictures there of like uh, writing, personal uh, inspiration. And I look at that board every day, you know. What's on the, what's on the board this year? What's, uh, what's your goal for 2020? There's, man, there's all kind of stuff there. There's, uh, there's some podium stuff. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a new car on there. There's a, there's a different house on there. There's, uh, there's 150,000 followers on TikTok on there. There's all kind of stuff on there, man. Oh, so it, it goes it goes from uh, investment properties to TikTok followers. So it's the, the the range is super wide. Yeah, I have it in like categories. So I have like personal stuff that I want. I have writing stuff that I want. I have like investment stuff that I want, and I put it in categories. And then every day when I walk in here, I just kind of glance at it and man that that visualization is super powerful and like pretty much everything that i've built today it it comes from that like this this house was in a binder because i had a bunch of ideas of this house and it's just because i looked at it every day so i've been to your house dude it's so sick it's and it's like the dream house you have uh, a beautiful house uh, a swimming pool a writing spot in your garage and I know you earned every square inches of that house. And it's like, I'm so proud of you, dude. It's like the way you do things is mind blowing on kids. Like if you want to get stuff done, write them down. Honestly, like it's the most efficient way to do it. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing is uh, if you're not writing down the goal that you have, it, it might not be that important. So just go through the ones that are really important to you and, and write them down. And it, eventually it's going to happen. Sometimes it might take two, three, four, five years. But as long as you keep writing it down every year, your chances of, of it happening are, are much higher. I'm, I'm, I promise you that. What's the craziest goal that was ever written on that board and never happened? Uh, something that never happened? Something that never happened. That you're still chasing. What's well, it's the craziest? The craziest. Know. Yeah, I mean, I just built this board this year, and the the crazy thing is, that I built a board that was up for three years, and the only reason I took it down is everything on the board came true, everything, and it it was mm. it was it was some crazy things on that board, man. So as of right now, everything has came true. So. One of the things that didn't come true was getting your money back from that contest in a Trinidad. <laughs> That's true, man. <laughs> let, me, let, let me tell you guys a little story. Back in 2012, 2014, when was that? Uh, I, it, it could have been 2013, I'm not sure. I don't know, 2013. 
I'm waking up, getting some mails, and I receive an email from a guy in Trinidad, and it says, I'm going to organize the biggest contest ever organized in the world with the biggest price money ever for a BMX contest, and it was $86,000 in Trinidad and Tobago, and he was like, that's government money, that's legit, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, fuck this. <laughs> this has never happened. This sounds like a scam. <laughs> but a bunch of professional riders, they went down to Trinidad to battle for 86 grand. And um, Terry was one of them. And the rest is history. Uh, I want to hear you say the story. <laughs> Man, and exactly like you said, when everyone got the, the email, they were, they were skeptical. And I, I remember I was at City Park riding with Scott when I, when I was reading him the email. And of course, immediately he said, that's a scam. Don't, don't, don't go there. That's a scam. No one's going to get their money. But, you know, I went and contests are always fun, right? Like you're, you're <laughs> around all your, or you're around all your homies. You get to see a new place. I had never been to Trinidad. I brought Vanessa. So I'm there with the wife, just having a good time. The thing that made me, I guess, uh, eerie about it is that the entire time, uh, Catfish was told to keep announcing on the mic about the 86,000. So all day, it's we're competing for the 86,000. So, of course, it puts it on the forefront of everyone's mind. Like, oh, yeah, we're here to win some money. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then there was a huge screen playing there. And it was also, it was a huge screen of Treblon talking. And it was also kind of talking about the money. Um, so yeah, I remember like right after the contest, I, I asked Treblon, I think I got fifth place or something. I just said, uh, Treblon, uh, uh, well, how, how do we get the money? And he said, oh yeah, just, uh, just you're going to send your bank info and, and things will be good. Which I thought that was a funny answer because we were told to stay an extra day so he could get the money. So everyone stayed an extra day, but man, long story short, no one got their money. No, no one got the money. So yeah, not for park, not, not for flatland. So when you don't give his money to Terry Adams, what does Terry Adams do? I'm asking you that, (laughs) man. I ran up that, I ran that phone bill up. Man, I called the I, I called the the people in the Trinidad government were so tired of me calling that uh, I think they blocked my number, you know, and they started giving me numbers to other people to to call that 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 I could ask. And for me, it was a little bit of a personal challenge because it wasn't so much about the money; it was. A lot about, I knew that some riders that went there had no sponsors. Some riders were like, man, I'm going to invest my plane ticket money. And uh, at least if I get 20th place, I get my plane ticket money back. Those riders that had no sponsors, they were counting on going there and placing in the top 20. And that's how they would make their their trip money back. And uh, man, I I was not only advocating to get my money back i was i was trying to get a lot of those guys that was was in the 10th place to 20th place to get their money back as well but uh i i wasn't able to get the money (laughs) so still to this day no money no money i'm gonna i'm I'm gonna get i i still send a message out you know once a month once every two months i'll track it down before i'm 60. dude that's (laughs) Hopefully you get that money. Let's uh let's come back to the beginning a little bit. Uh because you are you are from an interesting place in the United States, uh Louisiana. And yeah. uh one of the first video I've ever seen was I think props with uh the title was South Riders. Am I right? And it was uh it was you and Scott O'Brien uh writing yeah. on that video. Uh how is it to grow up in such a a small 
town area. And uh, how did you get into BMX in the first place? Man, actually, uh, there was a guy that was riding at a gas station uh, down the street from my mom's house when I was like seven or eight. And he was doing some tricks at the gas station. And uh, that was the first time I seen it. And my mom would would bring me by there every day to to watch him ride. And eventually he told us a video to order. And uh, <clears throat> and my mom wind up ordering that video for me. And then I, I got involved with some neighborhood kids was the, was the first thing that I did uh, in a really country area of where I live. There was, there was no even cement to ride on. There was a lot of dirt roads and stuff. And I started riding with those kids. We called ourselves the nuts team. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Was yeah. Scott a part of that? No, this was, man, this was, I was, I was such a little kid back then. Like I, I was probably eight and nine years old when, when I first got my intro to BMX. So after that, I actually started racing BMX, uh, in the, in the early nineties. So, man, I got a ton of, uh, BMX racing trophies up in the attic because I first, I became obsessed with just being on the track and, and getting those trophies on, on every Saturday. So, yeah. And that I feel like racing gives you so much bike control too. Like some of, some of the best uh, freestyle BMX rider, uh, such as Chad, Curly, Dennis Anderson, Chris Fox, they are fantastic uh, race uh, BMX guys. Uh, and I think the fact that you were racing first thing like helped you a lot with your tricks. Yeah, because then from the racing, I went to like riding uh, on box jumps to do shows for to do shows for like bike shops and stuff and. At that point, I, I, my bike really wasn't set up for flatland. I was just, I was just riding BMX, doing shows uh, for a little bike shop that I rode for, and uh, until I, I got a phone call from some guys in New Orleans, and um, they they asked me what kind of flatland tricks I could I could do, and I just lied. I I was a little kid, so I just said a bunch of trick names. I'm like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. I couldn't do any of it, but they the the guy was eugene collins and he said man we got to come down and and see you ride so they came down to to see all these tricks that i said i could do and uh i couldn't do any of them but they could tell that i that i had a fire inside of me so after that day man i i set my bike up for flatland and and i know ne i never turned back it was like i became obsessed with yeah. flatland it, it's it's that's the crazy thing about flatland is I don't know why, but once you get into it, it's like a drug. It's, it's crazy. Uh, it's, I think it's because it's so hard. Uh, when you chase a new trick, when you try to learn a new trick, the feeling of landing a new trick is, uh, is, is like so crazy. Yeah. It's, it's like you're floating or something. It, it's, it really is like, it really is like you have some type of power to be able to float around the bike like that. When you start to really learn how to like feel the flow and the essence of, of what it feels like to, to finally be able to, to take a trick that was once hard and then make it easy to go outside and do that. It, it really does feel like almost like you have a, like a special power or something. So as a kid, it really does get addictive and, man, I had these books, these notebooks when I was like 12 and 13 years old. And if I go through and read the stuff that I was writing, it, there's definitely some form of addiction because I'm, I'm writing and I sound like I'm possessed. The, the stuff that I, I'm writing, there was a part in the book where I'm writing flatland, 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 flatland. And then I wrote eyes closed and then I'm, my eyes are closed and I'm writing flatland with my eyes closed. Wow. Yeah, just because, man, I, I, in my mind, uh, I felt like I needed to be possessed to, to get really good. And man, I just, I, I, took, it to, I took it to the extre extreme like I do with everything. And uh, sometimes I, I do need to step back and, I, and need structure and, and balance with stuff that I do personally, because I'll get so obsessed to where I'll, 
I'll, I'll ride myself to death. So I almost have to take a step back and say like, okay, calm down, Terry. It's the bike will be there tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. That's, that's how you, that's how you turn pro. I think being so uh, motivated and uh, I feel like a lot of kids are always super interested to hear how did you turn pro? What was the moment you knew you were going from being a great am doing all kinds of tricks to like, oh, this is going to be my life now. What was the turning point for you? I guess for me, honestly, it's, it's a little bit of a different story because I was so obsessed with wanting to turn pro from an early age. Like, yes, I wanted to be a good bike rider. Yes, I wanted to, uh, to be a, a pro rider, but I was so obsessed with wanting to be a guy like inside the magazines and, and seeing these guys on the X games on TV as, as a kid, like, man, I knew from the beginning, like the, from the moment I could just pop a wheelie or do an endo, I knew that I was going to go as hard as I could to be a professional. And I didn't know that being a professional rider meant that I was going to get money from it. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that it meant that eventually I would get inside those magazines and, and people would know who I was and I could have the chance to inspire other kids, just like these magazine photos that covered my wall were inspiring me. So man, I, I knew like early, early on. So I probably started competing in pro like way too soon, actually, you know, I, because I was, I wanted to get there so fast. I kind of rushed into it. Really? Yeah. Like, yeah I which, did. Conte which contest in particular you think you were not supposed to write pro? Uh, maybe it was like a, a CFB contest in, in Florida. Uh, I think maybe was one that I maybe jumped into pro too quickly and the 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 drive was there the motivation was there the determination was there but at, at that point uh i probably could have waited another year or two but in a sense it just it just motivated me to go harder to to get to the level that i needed to be thing is with bmx uh turning pro or entering a pro contest doesn't really mean anything because if you are listening to this podcast uh and you want to enter pro at any events, except the UCI events, but at any private event, you can just pay the subscription fee and turn pro just to have the pro wristband. So it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, to me, turning pro means uh, making money with BMX and not having another job. So what was the transition from being like an am and then making money with bmx what was like the the first sponsor like the turning point for you i think a, a huge turning point for me was uh was red bull um it was like 17 years ago so i had some sponsors that were maybe giving me a, a little bit of money here and there uh very small money but you know Uh, Scott that you mentioned earlier, he was having a meeting with Red Bull at his house to present the idea of Voodoo Jam. And this was in 2003. And man, at that time, I was just at home hanging out, doing my thing, hang out with my girlfriend. And he said, dude, I had this meeting with Red Bull at my house to talk about this idea for this contest. If you come over here today, It, it can change your life. Like it can seriously change your life. And I said, ah, man, I, uh, I think I'll try to make it. And he said, no, if you show up here and meet these people at Red Bull, it can seriously change your life. And dude, I, I had maybe just got my license. Like just recently, I was just able to drive to new Orleans, like in that year. And I showed up there and he was right. It, it changed my life. That was the that was the start of my relationship with Red Bull because he was there just presenting a, a contest idea. And I was able to shake hands with, with some people there and, uh, 
and man, that, that was that first big sponsor that was able to give me some, some really, really great support and kind of send me around the world to, to show my talents. So that's, that's funny. It's really similar to what Miles, uh, Chamley Watson said in the previous episode, it's all about being at the right place at the right moment. But sometimes you have to force that. You have to make yourself be at the right place at the right moment. And yep. you going to this meeting was that. If you never go to that meeting, no Red Bull sponsorship, pretty much. Dude, we might not even be sitting here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, like when you have a feeling that it's it's important just make the effort and go out there it's that's one of the like tip i can give you it's like if you have you know your gut feeling that tell you that oh it's gonna be important maybe but i'm feeling lazy i might go tomorrow now go today go today that can change your life <laughs> yeah man that was 17 years ago and now uh i look back and and think that was it was such a life-changing moment for me because yeah, I was, I was entering pro in, in 2003. Uh, I was sometimes placing well in, in 2003, but I never had that support to really flourish as a professional rider. And when Red Bull came along, man, they gave me so many opportunities to, to, to bring my talent uh, around the world. And in hindsight gave me like, motivation then and i'm i'm still motivated t today from the support that i get so that's what i mean when you get a big sponsor like that of course the money is great and everything but the motivation you get from wanting wanting to not disappoint those people is even greater than the money you're like oh i have someone so sick to back me up and i, I just want to do good now i'm, I'm and i feel like That's the, that's the switching point for me. Uh, as, far, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that was the switching point for me. Being like, oh, okay, I have like a big company supporting me now. I'm gonna like, it's game time, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, you're right, actually, because it's the same for me as I've, I've never wanted to like take the life for granted because as you know, like this life really feels, it feels unreal to, to be able to wake up and do what you love and have like companies support you to do what you love. It's like when you wake up every morning, you're like, man, I need to do everything I need to do to keep this life going. And that's, that's been a, a huge reason why my career has went so long because I just never want to take it for granted, you know? So I'm going just as hard as I am today, like today as I, as I was, 20 years ago because I'm like, I just don't want it to end. It's, it's so much fun. And, uh, and I love it. I know, but your career such as mine has so many ups and downs. It's not like, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah. It makes, it makes like waves. And I know you, you've, you've had some dark times and we've been talking a lot about like the light and the fame and the Red Bull sponsorship. But in an athlete career, there are some dark times. My, one of my darkest times was like when I broke my ankle, uh, right before fees because I've, I've had partying the night before and, and I was so bummed. And that made me realize that, oh, fuck, I need to like step my game up and kind of find my way again. I feel like one of your darkest time was when you listen to the people that told you to remove your brakes because you were not cool uh, riding with your brakes. And then you enter Flat Arc, which is one of the biggest contests in Japan. And uh, you didn't even qualify for the finals because you... Uh, no, like... No, sorry, I, I got the story wrong. So uh, right before the contest, a lot of people were dissing you because you had brakes on. And you write the, the qualification of the contest And I think it doesn't go great for you. You don't make the finals and you decide that day to remove your break. And you made a big scene out of it. You threw them in the water and everything. And you, I'm, I'm bringing this up because you made a whole Instagram post about it uh, a, a few weeks ago. And I feel like that was one of the only moments in your career when you listen to uh, what people thought about you. And that yeah. fucked you up. And, yeah. uh, and 
tell me a little bit about that breakless era of yours. Yeah, you know, I guess when I think back is about one reason why I did that is I love Flatland so much sometimes that I'm also a huge fan of Flatland. Although I'm one of the top riders, man, I am like such a fan of all the top guys and all the top guys are running no break. And so for me, in a sense, I wanted to know what it felt like, but I was standing strong on keeping my break on for, for many years. What kind of pushed me over the edge was listening to the chatter in the background of maybe I should take off the break. You should try that with no break. And man, that stuff eventually, it, it got in my head a little bit, unfortunately. And I wound up taking off the break. And as you said, I, I made a scene out of it. At that time, when I took it off in front of everyone, I was thinking that this is the moment. This is the moment I'm going to like change my, my riding style. But when I think back to that moment, uh, I'm glad that it happened, but uh, I'm also very aware that it was the wrong thing to do because I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. You know, I was, I was doing it because of the chatter of, in the background of people that I was listening to. If I want to take off my break in five years from now, it's going to be because I want to take it off, you know, 100%. Um, So yeah, I rode without that break for like eight months. And during each session that I was riding, uh, I was learning stuff without the break, but it, it didn't feel right because when I took off the break, it, it wasn't for, it wasn't for the, 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 the true reasons that, that it needed to be. So like every session you, you'd be like, ah, I kind of missed the break, but I want to try to be breakless because other people think it's sick to be breakless no i think every day i was thinking uh that i took off the break for the wrong reason like oh, okay every day every day was in my head that man like the reason i got into riding bmx in the first place was you you do what you want to do you you do the tricks that you love you set your bike up how you want to set it up and the, there wasn't some crazy rules you you do what you want to do and that's what makes it freestyle so uh i think the fact that i went against what i believed in was what kind of tore me up inside so uh although those eight months of me riding without a break was a little bit of a setback it was also like a huge eye opener to man i, I gotta get back to me and I, i have to i have to refocus so well it's like a lot of things in life uh I gotta take a couple step back to move forward you know and i i feel like after this period we kind of kind of lost you a little bit on the contest scene you were not really traveling anymore but two years or three years ago uh terry started to come back with a new uh approach and that approach was uh having a professional bmx platform coach and uh, you were one of the first guy to do that And uh, this coach is not nobody. He's the most decorated BMX flatland rider ever. He's from uh, Finland. His name is Marti Kuopa. And he started uh, this program called MK Format, which I think it's incredible, uh, especially in the, the COVID-19 period. We're going to come back to that. But so you started this program with Marty. And a lot of people ask me, do you have someone that teach you how to do tricks? Uh, I'm like, no, this is my thing. This is my flatland. But Mari somehow pulled it off. Can you tell me a little bit more about the MK format thing? Yeah, honestly, you know, after Ledge was born was when I approached Marty because that's when I knew that I wanted to, to get back to the top of my performance level in the, in the contest game. And again, I wanted to do it in an unconventional way. Like we said before, like at the end of my career, uh, whenever that may be, I want to look back and not look how I, uh, not look back at the contest that I won, but I want to look back at how I got there and 
how I took an unconventional route to get there. So I reached out to Marty uh, and it was around the time he was just starting to, to get it going to like coach uh, riders like individually. And um, man, I, I just basically told him like, I, I want something to, to push me over the edge. I, I, I want to be back at, at my highest performing level. And it's been the greatest thing because as you know, I, I have a lot of determination. I had a, I have a lot of motivation and drive, but in my opinion, the one thing I, I was missing was uh, like structure and balance. And what I mean by that is, uh, as you know, as, when you, when you start to get a little bit older, you have more things on your plate, you know, like as I got older, I'm, I'm not just riding as a professional. I'm investing in different businesses. I have a kid now. Uh, I have all these sponsors that I have to keep up with. So sometimes that's where my riding lacked is I didn't have the, the structure to be able to know how much I needed to be riding and where I needed to place that riding uh, during the day. And I didn't have the balance because some some days I just, I'm a person that needs to be told like, dude, you, you need a day off. Like you rode really well today. Like you're on fire, like take a day off. And that's what I was missing. Those two things, the structure and balance. And uh, man, when I seen how Marty did his program with creating these sheets, it was like right up my alley. Like, oh, I get to document all my tricks and, and see where I need help with. And man, it's, it's really been a life changer for me because um, through like having that daily communication with Marty and also like he started me doing like daily meditation for, man, it's going on like a year and a half now. Like those two things have given me an opportunity to reflect on how my sessions went good or bad, how my contest placings went good or bad. And, uh, it's really put me in a different level, not just on the bike, but like in life. So, uh, I'm like, so happy with that decision already. You know, I feel like it's made me not only a better rider, but, uh, but a better person. What's the process? Does he send you like PDF files with tricks to do or stuff like that? Or what's the process of MK format? No, like, uh, basically it's those subtle details of like how, how you train, you know, um, you know, for, for years, I. I, I never had a problem with getting consistent because I, I did a, a five in a row process. But with Marty, uh, the first way I started training was I just, I was getting just 10 tries, you know, on a consistency sheet. And with those 10 tries of each trick, that's all I get. And so it was very different for me. And what was cool about it is it, it, it gave me a chance to like mix up the structure. Some weeks he would, we would train like that. And other weeks, uh, he would just have me out there kind of freestyling. And it was great for me to change it up because sometimes uh, I'm definitely an individual that needs someone to say like, Terry, change it up. Like you're going to drive yourself crazy out there. It's just my personality. But yeah, it's the subtle details, you know, like something even as small as him watching my contest run and saying, oh, this could flow better if, if you did this trick after this trick because you're making a big figure eight on the stage you know and you know he would point out other riders yourself and alex the way maybe you don't make a big figure eight on the stage from trick to trick so those little things to make your run flow better and then on top of that um working with the things that i may have been going on in my head you know where sometimes my my biggest roadblocks of uh you know, not being, not reflecting after each session and stuff. So that's amazing. If you guys want to, it's the, it's the little things anyway. Uh, when you are at such high level of performances, it's the little thing that makes a, a big difference. And, uh, if you guys want to check out what Marty is up to, uh, he's on Instagram, uh, Marty Kuopa, MK format. And I think it's great for, even for any BMX rider, street, park, flatland, like it's, it's great to like, uh, uh, adapt those advices uh, into your writing and uh, and thanks Marty for for putting that up and the master of, master of cre creativity as well and he's doing a lot for the scene even though he's a, a retired pro writer now and uh, 
I have so much love for, for, for this guy. Uh, COVID-19 has been uh, a turning point for you as well. When uh, I look at your Instagram photo you posted, like the before, after COVID-19, it's, it's fantastic. Did you, what happened? It's crazy. You lost 30 pounds. You just gained muscle. Like, it's crazy. Like, a lot of people were in confinement. They were drinking beers and drinking wine and getting weight. And you just got out of the COVID-19 confinement as fit as ever. What happened? Yeah, I mean, I guess with the with that going on, you kind of everyone kind of has a choice, right? They can they can either try to better themselves or to just kind of uh, stay at home and and do the opposite. So obviously, I'm I'm here training and I'm getting ready for when things start back up. So it just kind of made sense to, to not only uh, get, get in shape on the bike, but to get in shape off the bike. You know, uh, I feel like it was the one missing piece to the puzzle that I have going on right now, because, you know, I'm, I'm working on my mind. I'm doing all this meditation. I'm working on my bike. Uh, I'm riding every day, trying to get as good as I can. But then when I would look at my body and, I had that extra 10 pounds on me, which doesn't sound like a lot because I'm a skinny guy. Uh, actually looking at some older videos of me in the early 2000s, I was able to move around the bike just a little bit quicker. So um, it kind of pushed me looking at those old videos to, okay, if I'm going to get in shape, it's, there's, some, there's some downtime to do it right now because I don't necessarily have to be 100% ready for a contest. So. And so like what, you changed your diet, you changed your walking program, like? Yeah, I mean, I just went extreme with it, you know, the, no, <laughs> too extreme, man. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I, you know, no sugar, no bread, uh, 100 pull-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 push-ups, uh, 50 curls and one mile running a day. Uh, Every day and every day, yeah, yeah. I, I started with three days a week, and now and now I'm just obsessive. So I just take off running down the street every time I every time I I feel like it. Oh my god, dude! You're you're so extreme, and to to give to give you guys an example. So uh, I started this idea during the COVID nineteen uh, online with uh, five of my best friends. Uh, a, a, a digital game of bike so basically online game of bike so i would give a trick idea on a saturday and these guys had until sunday to do it and then another guy would give a trick and we had until monday to do it and so on and on and it was with uh terry obviously uh marty Quopa, travis collier frank lucas alex jumlin and rafael chique and dude, Terry got extreme with that shit. <laughs> and I, I love it though. And you, we ended up making a big thing out of this online event, which was not even an event, which was like kind of a game of bike between friends. So, and you ended up winning it, but you were so extreme with it. Can you tell me what was going through your head when you were receiving those tricks? Well, uh, it kind of goes to, you know, I have been, I had been working with Marty for a year and a half on just like being structured. Like I'm, I'm riding a certain amount during the day. I'm documenting all the tricks. I'm basically just like refining my contest run. And then this game comes along and it was the greatest thing that you added Marty to the, to the group because uh, he was a part of the game for a, a lengthy amount of time. So, uh, it, it, it gave me the opportunity to, he knew, he knew how addictive the game could be. So when he got out, he, he was never like, yeah, man, like he, he never had the attitude of like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't get obsessed with the game. He knew like, I'm obsessed. I'm off my structure every day. Like basically like, I don't have to have balance right now. Like go ahead and spend as much time as you want on, on the game. And Honestly, the most stressful part of the game for me wasn't the tricks. It was waiting for the approval. <laughs> it, 
like dude so basically terry would do the trick and then so he would send the writer that proposed the trick his trick submission and it was waiting for approval and he pulled the ellen the generous on us he was calling us he was sending us messages he was like dude can you tell me if the trick is okay <laughs> I'm not... but that you have such an addictive personality dude it's insane it's like <laughs> I think in the very beginning, I made the decision on my goal list that that I was going to win the game of bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I spent so much time learning you guys' tricks. Uh, it did mean a lot to me to finish out the game and win. Like, man, I got the trophy up there. And the trophy, to me, it means just as much to me as the Nora Cup. Because man, that that game went on for six a weeks. A month and a half. A month and a half, yeah. Yeah, it went on for a long so to spend that much time on the bike every day, dude, I was super proud to to pop that champagne and spray it all over the place. Dude, yeah, you told me you cried a little and shit. That's so sick. Like that's insane. That's I, the I level did. of that's the level of uh of dedication you were at at that moment. And it's 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 so crazy but you are so extreme with with things too like uh when i look at your social media you are one of the most followed um, bmx athletes on social media right now and for sometimes the way you are doing it the follower race and we've talked about that but it's like the way you were handling stuff was like so funny you are trying to do the craziest stuff you could think of and put them online do you remind do you remember that era what was going through your head at that moment? Yeah, that's why again I need that structure and balance because that's what I did if I'm if I have the goal to get followers it's hard for me it's hard to pull me away from that goal you know so I'm going to try everything I can to acquire followers and that's that's why I do need that that structure in my life because Sometimes I, I get fixated on something and I and I can't stop. So yeah, that, that era for me was, man, I was gonna jump from any object to any object and try to land on the bike just to just to get followers. And it wasn't the smartest thing because man, I ended up pulling pulling my groin muscle doing that stuff. And at some point I had to just say, like, okay, you're at a hundred thousand followers, like that's good. Like just you're going to kill yourself. Like, it's fine. It's, it's, you don't need more than that. Please, like, do yourself a favor. Go on at Terry Adams BMX on Instagram and scroll to, like, a year and a half ago. It's some of the craziest shit I've seen online. It's insane. Man. If you were partnering, you were partnering with influencers that were, like, doing backflips and stuff. But I was jumping out the roof of my car. Yeah. Yeah. Be why? Because you set those goals for you? Yeah, because I on the vision board for that year, I had that I wanted 100,000 uh, followers on Instagram. So my mind got like super focused in to where, man, my, my sessions on the bike were... Uh, I was, I was taking away from like true sessions on my bike, you know, uh, just to, just to gain followers. So yeah, in my head is I, I'm going to get this hundred thousand, no matter what I, I was ready. To, I was prepared to ride naked or do whatever I had to do, man. I was prepared. <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. But, and I think you bring a lot of that to the, to the contest, uh, runs as well. And Terry is one of the most. Uh, entertaining contest rider to watch because dude you do the craziest faces when you ride it's insane when do i've never missed one of your runs when i'm at a contest because i know i'm up for good times what's up with the faces yeah you know years ago i felt like something would come over me to where i was i was getting possessed you know like i sometimes i got some hate mail from some rider and they said man you don't have to do those faces you, you 
you don't you don't have to 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 get so angry and and so mean and your veins pop out like you you can do those tricks without those faces and i replied back like no i can't <laughs> that's i can't because something something comes over me sometimes and dude i i really think it comes from like how much i love riding and how much i i want to make sure I, I i sometimes pull that trick you know one of my favorite memory ever as a BMX rider one was Cologne 2005 I think when you pull the 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 A bomb it's basically like Terry is grabbing it's so hard to explain on a podcast but it's basically Terry is doing a crazy jump and landing on his backpack and he's always waiting on the last moment like pretty much when he's going off stage And in 2005, we had that contest and he's coming toward Alex Jimlin, my best friend, and I and Raphael. And we know he's going to do the A-bomb. And dude, he did the A-bomb literally like two inches away from us. And you pulled it and we jumped on you and the, the crowd went bananas. And that's, that's my favorite memory as, as a contest writer. Do you remember this, uh, this, uh, what I'm talking about? Yeah, actually, that that's that's one of my favorite moments in in my career as a contest rider. And I I didn't even win the contest. I got third place. But I look back and to have you guys supporting me on the side, like, dude, there was no doubt. I was looking for you guys. I when I was in that trick, I I steered your direction because because I wanted to do it like really close to you guys. Like I wanted you guys to have the front row seat, you know. <laughs> guys you have like I, i'm gonna try to find the footage online and post it because terry is doing the trick like a, a dangerous trick literally like five inches from my eyebrows <laughs> i'm just like ah! and, uh, that was that was one of the crazy moment do you think you could win fees 2021 in montpellier right now with your level of being in shape I definitely am in a good spot right now. If I if I look at my riding level 10 years ago and my riding level now, I'm I'm in a I'm in really good shape. So the goal is right now to be the best bike rider that I've ever been, you know, for myself and and for my son to see that. So uh I feel like my my chances are better now than they were 10 years ago, you know, because I'm I'm ready. Is that the ultimate dream? Because no, like no offense or whatever, but it's been a minute since you won a, a international uh, BMX flatland contest. You've, you've, you, you had a crazy run in the, the world championship last year. You got so close, uh, just missed the last trick. And I think you would have been pretty close to winning the world championship. You, is that the ultimate dream to like win one of these big contests? Uh, I would say that the goal is not to just win one. The goal is to stay on top for, for a while. Like, um, and it's, it's not a goal that's not going to happen. It's a goal that's going to happen. Like I'm, I'm here to stay. I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to have the six pack for more than six months. It's going to be there. I'm, I'm here to, I'm, I'm in the game, bro. Dude, that, and that's what I've been texting you. You definitely have the, when I, after yeah. I was watching the game of bike, I was like, oh, dude, you have the potential to just win any contest right now. And I really hope you do, dude. Like, I really hope you do. And, uh, and hopefully in Fizz uh, Montpellier 2021 and kick, kick all of our asses. But I'm going to give you a hard time doing that. <laughs> I know you are. Anyways, um, you bring, all this uh, extreme uh, mindset to other terrain that, than only like BMX Flatland. You've been really smart with uh, another thing, thing in your life is uh, uh, investment, property. And I feel like it's all that you have been learning through BMX that now you are able to be successful in that other uh, terrain. Can you tell me a little bit more about your um, in investment project? Yeah, really, the mindset came from, man, many years ago, I started to think about what am I going to do when these checks stop, this money stops coming from riding the bike. And uh, it was a scary thought. 
you know, it was a scary thought to think like, man, I've been living this dream for so many years. Like the moment this dream stops and the moment these, this money stops coming from riding the bike, I really want to be, I really want to be at a spot to where I can keep living this life of riding my bike and doing the things that I love. So I have to look back and be like super thankful that I met a, some few people that told me that you need to be smart with your money and invest it. So it was probably, man, close to 12 or 13 years ago, I started probably taking 90% of my income and investing the income that I was getting from riding my bike back into investments that were gonna, you know, put money back in my pocket later on in life. So I just got really serious with it. And I can look back now and be really thankful that I did that because now those ending years of my career may be coming up uh, in the next five plus 10 years. And so I can look back and be thankful that I started that process so early. So my advice to any athlete or any individual that wants to think about their future is, man, don't wait to do it. Just do it and then wait. Because if you're in your 20s or if you're in your early 30s or even your late 30s, even your early 40s, it's not too late to start. The, the important thing is to is to take your money now and, and start being smart with it. Exactly. That, dude, that was so powerful. Like, don't wait to do it. Just do it and wait. That was like... Yeah. And it's... that's that's what I did, man. And I started to see the, the fruits of doing that, like, really early. Like, the moment I did it, I'm like, oh, my God. It became addictive and it became... it, it In a sense, it, it's not hard to do. It's just... Sometimes it's a, a little bit of an inconvenience to to be a little bit smarter with your money than to just spend it. So, man, the the little inconvenience, just put it to the side and and be smart with with the money that comes in, and you'll thank yourself later in life. Like maybe not now, but later in life, you'll go, man, I'm I'm really happy that that I did that. Oh yeah. Well, another thing you do on the side of just writing BMX platform is organizing the most badass. BMX Platon event, my personal favorite uh, event uh, outside of Fils Montpellier. It's uh, the Voodoo Jam. It's, dude, I love that event. Uh, you are doing that with uh, Scott O'Brien for over, what was, the, what, what was the first Voodoo Jam? 2004. 2004. And you've been pretty much doing it every year on and off since 2004. Yeah, and you know, I have to give Scott the credit on this because it's it's really his idea and uh, he's really like the, the main person the, behind the idea of putting Flatland in this club and creating this energy uh, in the club that essentially we believe uh, help kind of sculpt the way Flatland contests are now around the world. But in the beginning, my kind of job with uh, Voodoo Jam was Scott would say, like in the beginning, we had to build the notoriety of the event. So he would just say, like, Terry, your job is you just got to get the riders here. So I would get on the phone with all the riders from Texas and hey, man, you got to come like and they would give me a hard no, like, nah, I, I can't make it. You know, money is tight and I'm a salesman, dude. So by the time I got off the phone, they're like, hey, you know, I check with the family. I'm going to pull some money. I'll be there. And so then I would call Scott and be like, dude, we got Texas. And he'd be like, all right, call France. Like, like get France here, get Germany here. After that, move to the West Coast, call Jesse, get those guys here. And then I would call Scott 20 minutes later. All right, dude, I got the West Coast. They'll be here. So <laughs> I get the West Coast, bro. <laughs> yeah. And, the West Coast. <laughs> yeah and, and in a way I was, you know, he's like, all right, you know, you're the pit bull, go get the riders. And in the beginning, that was kind of my, my job. And as years went on, my job was to help with the sponsors and, uh, and it was to make sure the crowd was there. So that's what, that's what I do best is uh, running around, making sure that people are, are, are going to be there to fill the crowd for, for you guys to make sure the energy is, is electric. Dude, when you have like something in your head, nothing can stop you. He, dude, Terry was selling tickets one by one in the street. Just, you're insane. 
one of the just one more story is because it's I love those. It's a uh, the hobby lobby parking lot, and mm. I think what you didn't no didn't you get a picture uh somewhere on that uh parking lot or something like that that what what, uh, what was the story I love that story it's fucking incredible and I I know a lot of people are gonna love that story because it just shows your dedication. Oh, uh, that, that's, I think you're talking about the shopping mall. There's a shopping the shop, mall. Yeah, the shopping mall. Yeah. Yeah. Here in Hammond. And there was a big window in the front. And, uh, dude, I just, I just kept going to talk to the mall manager, like all the time, because I'm like, man, how sick would that be to like have a flatland photo in the, in the front, you know? And, uh, I ended up paying for the photo. Uh, I paid for the photo. I paid to have it shot. Uh, the photo was me like riding inside the mall and uh yeah we ended up getting it and i the photo ended up staying there for like six or seven years until they tore down the mall but yeah everyone would always like roll past and be like man how did you get that photo in that window i'm like because i paid for it <laughs> <laughs> how much how much did you pay for it <laughs> It wasn't much. It was like 350 bucks or something. But yeah, I think she was like, yeah, you know, the manager of the mall is like, yeah, we don't really have the budget for that. And I'm like, yeah, I got the budget. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I can pay for that. I get the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> get the West Coast. Oh my God. And the Hobby Lobby, like paper, Hobby Lobby is like a, a, a mall in the States where Terry used to ride. And didn't didn't you have like a written authorization to ride in this parking lot somehow? Yeah, yeah. The the guy that uh, gave me permission there, he actually is the the guy that helped me with the investments in the beginning because he would stop there and say like, "Man, you're not allowed to ride here." And I'm like, "You don't own this place." And he said, "I I do own this place." And I I come to realize the guy owned like seventy percent of my my town like all the land and all the property and he owned the land that the hobby lobby was on so he, he said if you come to my office at seven o'clock in the morning not 701 not 702 i'll give you permission to ride there and uh man i showed up at his office at seven o'clock i gave him a signed copy of the of the cover i did i had with ride and started the relationship with this uh older man and uh he not only gave me permission to ride there, but he was the one that kind of helped me be smarter with my money because he would stop out there to watch me ride. And then he would also say, like, what, what are you doing with your money? Like, you have to be smart with it. So he he's the one that that kind of jump started me being smart with my money. And, you know, if I told him I had a certain amount saved, he would he would tell me what to do with it. So. Wow. So from being the guy that told you to kind of piece off his parking lot. He became your business partner. He became my mentor, man. I, I still talk to him uh, all the time and he still gives me advice. And, you know, thankfully, uh, he, he, I went and got the written permission from him because he respected me for that. And, and he, uh, he felt like, uh, you know, I was smart enough to, to listen to the advice that he was going to give. And that's one thing about me is I'll, I'll, I'll take some advice. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to people. So I, I was happy that I did in that sense. Again, guys, like it's all about being at the right place and at the right moment, but also be respectful to everyone. You know, Terry could have been uh, a dick to this guy selling, yeah, 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 I'm just riding my bike, uh, fuck off, blah, blah, blah. But he's, you've been res like, yeah, you had respect for this guy and it ended up being a great opportunity for you. So positivity is always going to win over like, yeah and you know i looked like a uh like i looked wild out there i had my hair in braids i had my flatland tattoo going across my stomach my my pants are hanging down really low so he could have easily said like man i'm not going to give this kid permission so you know that was a, a testament to him as well to to not to not judge someone you know he could have been like man this guy's not going to do tricks in my parking lot but it is great that he kind of looked past and say like, man, he's, he is out here doing something positive, you know? Oh yeah. What, um, what advice would you give to 12 years old Terry Adams? If you, if he was right in front of you right now, let's say I am 
12 years old Terry Adams. What do you want to say to him? Man, I, I think I would say that uh, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. Like, because that's the furthest from the truth. You know, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, it doesn't matter what it is. Just stay positive, stay humble, and keep always working towards that goal and don't give up because sometimes you really never know how close you are to uh, accomplishing that goal. Like sometimes you could, you could be right around the corner from it and you just give up because your friends are giving up on their goals and their dreams. And you really have to take a step back and realize that you could be really close. And the moment you walk away, you could have been like, you could have just been busting down the wall to make it happen. So that's the difference between, in my opinion, all the people out there that make it and the people that don't make it is that the people that make it, they never gave up in it. And the never giving up attitude is what's going to like take you to the end because it's eventually going to happen and you're going to be proud of yourself for getting there. So don't give up. Dude, never. And it might sound, it might sound cliche and people be like, yeah, that's bullshit. But there is them, right? You're never going to know if you give up. <laughs> you never know. Like if you give up, you're never going to know what's behind the walls. If you don't give up, man, you have a reason to leave. <laughs> hey, I, I could have, I could have gave up on Ellen. Uh, two and a half years ago before they put me on the show, but you, you never know. So, so you, you got, you got to keep going, man. You, you got to keep going. You got to keep doing your thing. So. And uh, the question I ask uh, a lot on that show is uh, an advice for the younger generation. Uh, let's say a little kid that's talented and uh, kind of want to be sponsored, but is struggling to get sponsored uh, and one advice for him. The advice would be to not focus so hard on getting sponsored. Focus on your craft, focus on getting better and, and all that stuff will, will come later if it needs to come. So you almost have to, to find yourself first and you know, dig really deep into the talent that you're, that you're going for. And then eventually like, They, they'll find you and then you'll see your opportunity, but uh, just don't give up. It, it's, it's kind of the same, same advice really of uh, just keep doing what you love and then great, great things will come. You'll know when there's the right time to push, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like you, kind can, of you can always at, pick up the phone. Go ahead. Look at the, look at the bigger pictures uh, of like writing before just focusing on the, on the sponsorship and, There are, there are so many ways to do it these days, you know, uh, social media, YouTube, just film yourself with your friends, put some videos out there, uh, go to contest. Uh, there are like so many ways. And I feel, feel, think that 2020 is a great era for self-made men. There are like so many ways to make it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It's, uh, It's a cra it's it's a crazy world right now of like with social media and you know everything going on with content like all kids can just kind of choose their path you you just have to you just have to know which path you want to go down and stick to it you know like if if you're going to start a YouTube channel you know don't try it for for four months and then give up don't focus on the amount of subscribers that you have focus on the content that you're putting out and eventually you'll get results. Exactly. There's that video of that girl that was doing roller disco that went viral a few days ago and she had no followers like two weeks ago and then all of a sudden she has like half a million followers. So again, you never know until you're going to make it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, did we miss, dude? We've been, we've been killing it. We are like an hour and a half in. Uh, Any more things you want to talk about, homie? Like I think we, I mean, I think we're good. I, I think, think we, I think it. we covered. <laughs> I think we covered some stuff, man. We covered some ground. Oh, just Wait. one more thing. What's your? 
Oh my god, look, Terry is uh, showing me his, uh, his, uh, his trophy of the game of bike right now. He's so proud. I'm, I'm going to do a screenshot of that and put it, uh, oh, and put it on. There no, go. it's good. I'll do it afterwards. Uh, I'll do a, a screenshot of that and put it on, on my, uh, on my Instagram. Just one last thing. What's your, what's your take on the, on the Olympic? If Flatland is going to make it to the Olympic, would you be stoked or do you think it's lame? No, nah, I would be stoked, man, because when I think back about why I got so motivated to and so inspired to ride Flatland when I was a kid, it was because I seen it on TV. You know, I seen it on the X Games. I I would pop my tape in and record it off, off television. So in my opinion, if there's any way to get Flatland on the forefront on a world stage like the Olympics, it's going to be a good thing because it's ideally it's going to, it's going to create more interest and, and more kids get into riding. So I'm all for it. And of course I, I want it to happen. I, I want to represent for, for team USA and uh, I'd be lying if I told you that's not what I'm working for over here. You know, I'm, I'm preparing, you know, just in case we have that chance of, of making it in. Oh yeah. I'm the same way, homie, team friends all the way. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, guys, um, I think that's a wrap for this episode of Decoding Athletes. To one of the realest in the game, Terry Adams, check him out on Instagram at Terry Adams BMX. He's killing it on TikTok as well, Terry Adams BMX. And uh, dude, I love you so much. Thanks for being a part of the of my show uh, on that Red Bull Decoding Athlete podcast. And uh, dude, I can't wait to hang out. It's been so long. We're going to do it. And thank you again for having me. This was dope. and. Uh... Let's talk soon.